So three, two, one. Obviously, you wait for the guests to arrive. There's often a few like seconds and stuff gap. Three, sure. two, one, start. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to uh, another amazing event by King's College London uh, and uh, ITSS Verona. I mean, like, we are going to be waiting, uh, I think, like, for a couple of uh, more people like, I mean, like I mean, to show up. Uh, but that said, uh, let me just take this opportunity to welcome you all and to thank uh, our, our team at the School of Security Studies, in particular Lizzie and Danny uh, from the Defense Studies Department, where I am a lecturer. My name is Michele Groppi. I am a lecturer at, as I was saying, at the Defense Studies Department, and I'm the president of the um, International Team for the Study of Security Verona. Tonight, we have an unprecedented opportunity, arguably, to talk about something which has been, uh, I, I'd probably say, like fairly disregarded. And so, you know, like, as, as I was saying, right, as, he, as we wait for more people, but let me just once again, like, say thank you. Thank you so much to, I mean, like, Julia Hodgins, uh, Hoggins, uh, that uh, um, who I will obviously I mean, uh, introduce uh, in a little bit uh, to our guests from Canada and uh, Peru, our distinguished panelists uh, and uh, our students uh, from King's College London and the Defence Academy and elsewhere in Europe and the world. So without, without, uh, without any further ado, you know, like in international relations, uh, sometimes uh, we tend to forget uh, that emotions are also important. If we go back to major theories of international relations, international security, mm -hmm. we talk about realism, we talk about liberalism. And so no matter how you look at it, the measure, the measure of the international system, the unit of the international system ends up being the state. And therefore we're talking, uh, we're talking about power. We're talking about great power competition. We're talking about the kinetic side of military force. All of that is good, absolutely. I mean, no question about it. That is going to shape international security. Nevertheless, nevertheless, as experts, scholars, students, observers of international security, we shouldn't, we should not minimize other aspects, other elements of society that can be as instrumental. And tonight, as I was saying, we have a great chance, a great opportunity to delve deep into something which, let's be honest, sometimes uh, I'm not going to say that it bothers us, but, but maybe it scares us, it shames us, or, uh, or something that might make us feel uncomfortable, especially in societies, in, in countries around the world that have undergone uh, uh, colonization, major uh, structural societal reshaping, uh, and now they're trying to carve an identity out of it. And so, I mean, without any further ado, I think I have blathered way too much. I would like to to present uh, Mila to you um, the the mind behind all of this. Who is uh, Julia Huggins? Julia is a student at King's College London in the International Affairs MA. She, she previously earned her BA with honors. So, I mean, congratulations, Julia, in sociology at the University of Fraser Valley in Upsford, Canada. She's also one of our, um, our research interns uh, at uh, ITSS Verona for the Culture Society and Security Team. Her interest in social uh, restoration, collective memory, human rights and motivated to propose the topic uh, um, of this evening uh, that she's about to introduce uh, along with our distinguished panelists. So once again, Julia, without any further ado, whatever you want, the floor is yours. Uh, and thank you very much again to everyone. Uh, I really hope this is going to be uh, an amazing event. Apologies, one thing that I forgot, uh, please uh, uh, team, uh, keep in mind, uh, this is, uh, um, you know, like a, a, it's, uh, it's being recorded. Uh, Let's be very respectful of other people's uh, uh, opinions. We can absolutely challenge, uh, but always with respect uh, and in a constructive manner. At the end of the presentation, uh, we're gonna um, we're gonna welcome uh, um, Dr. Dr. Andrea Elners uh, from uh, uh, King's College London and her final remarks. And then I'm gonna be doing the Q and A. So that please do feel free. Uh, I, I, we, we, we do encourage you to ask questions to our uh, distinguished panelist. Julia, whenever you want, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Groppi. Thank you especially for your support. 
I want to welcome our guests. Share Indigenous Memory, Persecution and Divided Societies, Path Towards Healing and Reconciliation. Narratives behind traumatic events that impact specific groups in a country permeates mental and emotional layers, as Dr. Grappi was saying, driving discussions, beliefs, attitudes, and sometimes those legitimate policy decisions, what results many times intended, intentional or not, in social fragmentation. The cases discussed tonight, Canada and Peru, have not been exhausted within the international relations academic debate as pointed out earlier, while both underwent processes of truth inquiry, a social reconciliation is still to be reached. Recent developments nevertheless invite to further explore them with academic rigor. Today, our guests will discuss the recent discoveries of unmarked grave sites in premises of former indigenous residential schools in Canada, something that we all heard felt, and the forced sterilizations of more than 270,000 indigenous women from rural communities disadvantaged during the 90s in Peru, another big heart-hurting event. Our guests tonight have conducted rich academic work in those matters. The discussion will focus in four research subtopics that each speaker is going to address like in a double interview after I pose a question. First, Mr. Frogner, and after Dr. Ruiz, the arrangement is just the alphabetic uh, order of the countries, Canada and Peru, that's all. From Canada, let me welcome Mr. Fra Raymond Frogner, currently the head of the archives at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and co-chair of the International Council for Archives Committee on Indigenous Matters. Raymond holds a Master of Arts in History from the University of Victoria and a Master of Archival Studies um, from the University of British Columbia. He was archivist and uh, at the records in the University of Alberta and he taught classes in archives and indigenous records. He is the principal author of Tandenia Adelaide Declaration Concerning Indigenous Self-Determinations and Archives. His two articles in Archivaria discussing archives and indigenous rights have won the prize WK Lam. From Peru, we have Dr. Ines Ruiz, academic coordinator of the communication and advertising bachelor in the Universidad Científica del Sur and teaches communication subjects in Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. She obtained her master's and PhD in Hispanic studies at the Kent University, where she also taught for a while. In Peru, she has collaborated with diverse non-profit organizations. Both her last documentary title, A Sterile Voice, and her last book, Midnight Verse, study the case he is discussing today. Also, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Andrea Elmer, lecturer in Defense Studies at King's College London and in the Defense Academy of the United Kingdom. She is a multidisciplinary researcher combining historical and contemporary political societal and cultural perspectives, mostly focused on gender, security, human rights, moral injury. Andrea designs and delivers subjects. Currently, she teaches women, peace, and security that I will take with her in November. She has written and published multiple policy papers, articles, book chapters, and she has co-authored the book when soldiers say no. I am honored to have her as my dissertation supervisor and I will have to work a lot. Welcome, Dr. Andrew. Michele, you wanted to say something? Dr. Brock? No, 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 crack on. Dr. Elner, please give us your keynote speech. Welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. And first of all, apologies for being a bit late. I had a prior appointment and had to, and it overran and I couldn't stop it. And I had to drive at very high speed along very narrow lanes without having an accident. I managed and I'm really pleased to be here. It gave me a great excuse to drive fast. So <laughs> what's not to like? Um, ground yourself. Um, I am so pleased to have been asked to deliver some keynote um, just remarks to, to start this event today because it's a, it's a hugely important um, event that, that um, um, Julia and Michele have put together. And I'm very pleased to have two speakers who will, I think, um, really give us a lot of food for thought. 
when I thought about how to frame this, I thought, well, the theme includes memory. And I need to go to a very high abstract level because I've got five minutes. I probably will have seven minutes, but um, therefore I need to frame your specific discussions on um, transgressions, on crimes against humanity, on, on just state brutality in effect um, in, a, in a wider context. And because there's the word memory in the title, I thought well, memory is um, codependent on forgetting. So I think I'll set this up by looking at forgetting. We can forget in many different ways. Forgetting is as identity building and as history writing as, as remembering. Remembering can be integrative. It can be um, divisive. It often implies power and power hierarchies, depending on who sets the parameters of what is remembered and what is forgotten, how much society can shape and different parts of society can shape what is remembered and what is forgotten. Whether this forgetting is an instruction so that people have to remember to forget or that people need to not forget to remember. I have a German half of my heritage. As a German growing up, going to school in Germany, you do remember to remember. And my generation very much um, had, to, had to remember to remember, and I still do. Memory and forgetting also have a lot to do. So this is partly history writing, identity forming. But memory and forgetting or remembering and forgetting are also part of knowledge construction. So what is what knowledge counts as acceptable knowledge? What is the dominant narrative? Who gets to contribute to this narrative? Who is allowed, whose voice is, is, is allowed to, to be heard? And there's the power relationship again. There's the politicization of memory and forgetting. If we're taking the view of the state, the state with a part of society that I would call a co-opted part of society that dominates the narrative, that co-opted part of society and the state can together through structural and systemic conditions which enable personal expression of, 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 of disruption and, and denigration. Together, they can exercise a great deal of violence on people who are not part of that dominant narrative. So that experience of violence then is harmful, not only to the way in which people feel they are part of the overall society, but it's also harmful to them as individuals and to them as collectives. As a collective, they might find shared memories which then are identity forming, which may be identity forming in a very, very negative way, which then can potentially be turned against them as, well, they're just professional victims. And we have this discourse at the moment over the Black Lives Matter in the US and in the UK. But I'm not so interested in that particular discourse. I'm more interested in what happens when you deny people access to what makes their memories. And archivists are very important in allowing access to those memories. If we don't have written memories, then maybe rituals can tell us where the past lies. And we are, you know, indigenous communities can see can, can write their own histories because through rituals, they, they write a history of sorts in, in different ways, not necessarily in written form. But the point is, if you're not allowed to write your history and if you're not allowed to contribute your history, then you're denied the right to exist, to be acknowledged as a life worth living, which means your past, you can never really have a past which identifies you as you because you have not told your story in the shape of his story or her story or a collective story. So this denial to, one's own, to, to, to have a voice or to research one's own history then can have all sorts of educational implications as well. 
but it's also a denial of agency and of human dignity. And that part, that denial of a past, then becomes a denial of a present. And the denial of the present then spills over into the future because you're also excluded from imagining a future in which you are part of the whole. And I, I think, because my time's pretty much up now, I hope that this sets up our two speakers to talk about how we might break this cycle, because what we need to do, what I think we need to do to break the cycle in big, bold parts or steps is to remember, to think about different ways of remembering and, and, and putting together histories. But remembering is not the only thing, they have to be heard. And that then can translate into political and cultural agency through educational systems, through societal discourses, through engagement with governments. And then hopefully the healing can start. I hope this builds a stage on which the two speakers will feel comfortable. And I look forward to hearing your presentations and then to the Q&A session and the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Elner, for such thoughtful uh, opening remarks. And I'm going to proceed with the first question. Please, doc, uh, Dr. Inez and Mr. Raymond, describe briefly the justification narratives that frame the events, the regime groups, or the perpetrating the actions, and the modus operandi, if you could. Are there other events impacting the survival of the same population? If so, what are the common threads between them, Dr. Raymond, uh, Mr. Raymond? Um, well, okay, that's a very, very broad question, but let me begin by just saying that um, the, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation was a child of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was struck in 2007. And, and the mandate of that commission was to investigate as completely as possible uh, the history of the residential school system in Canada and its legacies on Indigenous peoples and the Canadian state and the Canadian society, I should say. Um, but essentially, writ large, um, what the question was is, or uh, what the hope we can move towards is, how do we reimagine belonging in a society of diversity? Um, and so in the mandate of the TRC, um, it was really uh, the culmination of, of, of a couple of decades of manifestations by Indigenous peoples um, to be recognized within the Canadian constitution and by Canadian society. Um, and just to, to, to situate us a little bit further, um, the, the Canadian residential school system, because I'm recognizing this as an international audience, um, began in the 1880s with a mandate that was essentially to, to assimilate and um, produce a kind of cultural erasure of all the identities of indigenous societies and communities across the country. Um, and then it, by the time it ended in 1996, which was approximately seven generations, um, many of these communities had, um, had been deconstructed, uh, languages were lost, social practices and customs had been destroyed and outlawed, and in many cases even um, made illegal to be practiced. Um, so the, the social identity of these communities um, was successfully um, dismantled by removing forcefully children from those communities, placing them in residential schools. Um, where they were, um, you know, remodeled as what was thought to be um, appropriate citizens for the, you know, to, to, to become part of the Canadian state, as it was understood by, by settler society. So with all that said and done, um, the mandate of the TRC was really uh, a truth commission. Um, it had no subpoena powers. It couldn't cause to um, anyone to be charged with any kind of crimes. It was essentially um, a mandate to discover and create a body of knowledge on the history of the residential school system in Canada um, and, and its consequences, its legacies. So as a result of its research, the TRC collected over 4 million documents from almost 150 different cultural repositories, religious as well as government, provincial and federal. And over the six years of its investigations, it visited slightly over 200 different um, indigenous communities and held the events there where over 7,000 settlers or survivors and intergenerational survivors gave testimonies on the impact of the residential school system, which was essentially the, a contemporary legacy 
of what was what had happened to those um, communities as a result of the residential schools. So the NCTR in 2015 ingested all of that information. And since then, we have been in the process of trying to create what we're calling a decolonizing archive, an archive that makes it possible to actually interrogate oppression, to make the records understandable for researchers in a way that they can be used to heal, to reconcile, and to educate on the topic of, of this kind of colonial oppression. Um, so moving forward to today, um, I, should be, I should have begun my speech by just saying that um, the center as an indigenous research center is currently in a state of mourning. As you've mentioned, there have been four um, dramatic discoveries of unmarked burial sites across Western Canada. Most of them number in the hundreds, um, including the Penelicut, um, the Tequemlumps Te Sequempum, uh, the Conexus, um, and the Kaosis. Um, and in all of these cases, uh, these unmarked burial sites um, are located near residential schools um, and are thought to include or thought to um, hold um, the remains of children that attended those schools. In many of these cases, these burials occurred without the families being notified that the children were lost. Um, and in fact, in 2017, or sorry, in 2017, um, I, we did a documentary at the um, NCTR on one of these schools, not one of the four that I just mentioned, but Muskaugan Residential School, where we investigated and did a five to six minute documentary um, interviewing survivors and walking through the areas indicating where it was thought that um, uh, my burial sites are located around this school. And it's known that um, human remains have, um, due to soil erosion, been found in those fields. So uh, the, that, that site is currently also under investigation. I only mention this to say that in 2017, when we released this documentary, it received absolutely, almost absolutely no response by the media or any kind of um, popular uh, research whatsoever. Um, it's only this year with the dramatic discoveries, um, the, the, the sheer scale of the, of the, of the loss um, that it's finally hit home. Um, so we remain, we remain with the same mandate to understand the impact um, to heal from it, to educate. Um, and building on the idea of memory, we are what we choose to remember, but we're also what we choose to forget. Um, and this is a moment in time where Canadians are beginning to remember um, exactly what has happened um, and to recognize that. And, and hopefully over time to, to reconcile and perhaps remodel this relationship between settler and indigenous peoples on a, on a platform of equality, uh, dignity, and human rights. Thank you very much, Mr. Frogner. Dr. Ruiz, please. Thank you very much for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes? Okay, thank you very much. First, I want to um, start explaining what was the campaigns, um, the contraception campaigns uh, that were held on the Peruvian government in 1995. So uh, during 1995, the Peruvian government took the drastic decision to reduce the rate of natural population, grow to a level no greater than 25 per annum, and put in a place a series of campaigns to promote it by the Alberto Fujimori regimen. These campaigns, they were so-called campaigns of voluntary surg surgical contraceptions, anticonception quirúrgica voluntaria, focus on groups of men and women on reproductive capacity, especially those living in the poorest areas of the Andean highlands of the, uh, and the Amazonian lowlands of Peru. Uh, they were sterilized for contraception purposes. These sterilizations contains led of thousands of complaints. The data collected during those years by the OMSPONS uh, office included some 2,000 to 2,074 women sterilized against their will, of which 10 die. Now, more than a decade, actually it has passed 25 years since the um, uh, complaints began, new cases have emerged and there is talk up uh, about uh, three, 300,000 victims. Many women express in different testimonies their central certainty of having been uh, misformed, 
treatment and abu abuse by the medical services responsible for the sterilizations. So um, these mass sterilizations campaigns were carried out during the second half of the regime of Fukimori. It's 1995 to 2000. And aim to include the surgical esterization made on free of charge with family planning programs. As I said before, more than 25 years has passed since the complaints about the poor execution of the campaigns began. Between 1996 and 2000, uh, despite of the complaints made by feminist groups and human rights organization, and even by the Ounsbones uh, office, the campaigns were unsuccessful. Only in 2001, the case of Ma uh, Maria Mameta Mestanza, who died uh, on April 4 in 1998 due to medical negligence during the surgical sterilization operation, was a pure friendly settlement agreement was agreed. Um, as the majority of the sterilization were practice of women of the Andean and the Amazonian extraction, uh, whose first language is not Spanish, um, my research uh, shows that the program public health law has not been equal for everyone. On the investigation, uh, I explore the way in which these women see their fertility and the place it occupies in the world. So um, was personal fertility related to the fertility in their land? Did they understand these procedures were irreversible? Was their link to the land broken once they discovered they were no longer fertile? What were the consequences to these individuals? Did it result in migration, marital breakdown, or other procedures? How did they face a surgical uh, procedure? When their sense of modesty and lack of famili familiarity with medical procedures was absolute ignored. How did the woman from the Highlands province involuntarily involved in this pro program constructed their memory? And here's the part that is very interesting. How is memory rich um, in this program? What did they remember? Along the research, I also um, researched some interviews and testimonies of citizens from Lima. Lima is the capital of Peru. And it was very interesting to understand how do they understand and see this problem? How was the memory construct about the program? So the aim was to provide evidence of how memory was created by the incorporating these events into a hegemonic racist social discourse that allows them to disregard the rights of the population affected by these policies. And here is how race and class intersected with these historization campaigns. I don't know if I have time enough or should I continue? Should I continue? Uh, maybe you can uh, go ahead and wrap up. Thank okay. I continue? Yes, yes, you can continue. Yes, sure. I, didn't, I didn't hear you very well. So I was saying, um, how does uh, race and class intersect with these sterilization campaigns? And here we have to look very careful for the actors who participate in these um, Anticoception Quirúrgica Voluntaria programs, the AQV. Um, so they were Fujimori, you know, his former ministers, the ceramist, which are the practice of the medicine, feminist groups, church, also international and non-government organization, and lastly, the media. This affected the execution of the campaigns and their consequences. But one of the reasons why more than 20 years have passed and the case is still awaiting for justice is the great silence of the citizens who have not now respond or confront the complaints that for years, women for the poorest sectors, sorry, of Peru has been making. This silence 
is related to the great inequalities of, of my country of Peru, which touch aspects such race, gender, and poverty. So in this sense, um, I propose two fundamental reasons that sharp the rejection and indifference toward the case. In the first place, the um, races in all socioeconomic uh, cl uh, classes in the city of Lima. We have to remember that Lima is a very it's a big city. Um, most of the population in Peru live in Lima. So this is related to the paternalistic discourse, not only on the population, but also in terms of health policies. And this is here when the government um, worked together with the paternal, uh, paternalist discourse uh, of the people that live in Lima. Secondly, the misformation that there was uh, on, the such, uh, on, the, sorry, on the subject for a long period. This misinformation caused, of course, by the lack of interest of the media during the electoral campaigns of the democratic period that in, uh, in, in, begin in 2000, as well as the media, and this is important also, manipulation uh, in the era of Fujimori. These two um, subjects are the re rejection and lack of interest of the cases of women who claim to have been sterilized against their will. Thank you very much. The second question is, what was the impact in terms of, do we have a death toll? Is there a re relevant geographic pattern? Was there also a linguistic genocide or other harmful effects in survivals, witnesses, and society? So now we move from the context to the effect. Doctor, excuse me. Mr. Prognor, please. Sure. Um, uh, in terms of uh, a death toll, uh, there is an understanding um, reality that there is a, a certain amount of missing children um, from attending residential schools. Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission began to look into this. Um, and quite interestingly, um, when the URSA, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, was first struck in 2007, the question of missing children was actually not part of the agreement. This agreement was struck between church groups, as I said, church groups, um, indigenous groups, as well, representatives and um, the government. Um, and it was only after um, an MLA, an indigenous MLA by the name of Marasti raised this in the House of Commons that um, the question of missing children was added to the, the investigations. So the preliminary investigations done by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came up with a, a number of uh, several thousand, slightly over 3,000, um, but due to the amount of time and the, and the enormous amount of research, because these are issues that had never really truly been formally researched before in a collective way, um, they never completed their research. So in 2015, we picked up on that work, um, verified the incomplete research and created um, what has been known as the death register. Um, when, the, when the TRC completed its, its research in 2015, they put out 94 calls to action. These were recommendations that they thought would be um, appropriate in order to address the, the, the broken relationship between Indigenous and settler communities. So call to action number 72 was to create a, a death register, as they called it, um, and a database of, of the, the, the missing children. So we did that. We started to create, we created the, the death register, which profiles every missing child with 15 fields of information, um, gender, uh, cause of death, home community, et cetera, because many of the records that we found um, uh, didn't record these things. In over half the cases of, of recorded loss of children, the cause of death wasn't recorded. In almost 30% of the records, um, the gender of the child was not recorded. Um, many, of the, many of the losses um, went without even identi formal identification of the name of the child. Sometimes it's only a number. So the death register is the first, um, is still in the first phase of, of, of going through um, all the details of the losses that we've identified. Um, and to this point, we've identified 4,118 children documented as having been lost while under the responsibility of residential school authorities. We've included in this um, 
children who were sent away due to illness and died within a year of being sent away. Um, that's also included in our, in our um, category of lost children. But having said all that, um, that's only going through, we've only gone through about a third of our records. Of the over 4 million documents that we hold, we've done approximately a third um, to get to that number. Um, to honor that loss and to commemorate that loss for, for Indigenous communities, we've also created um, a memorial site, a memorial website in ctr.ca slash memorial, where um, we list the name of each child um, and, and the school they attended and the date of their death. Um, this was done after six months of consultation with Indigenous communities around the country to ensure that there was no information that we would release that would have um, been a violation of a cultural protocol or had been somehow harmful to the home community or the family who lost a child. So um, for that reason, um, the memorial site does have a limited amount of information, but the death register itself is very comprehensive. However, it should be stated, only families have access to the death register. Um, any other access to this database is by special consideration. And the NCTR has um, what is known as a survivor's circle, um, seven survivors of residential school from around the country. Um, and we consult with them on policies and decisions such as this kind of access to, to a to the death register. Um, so to answer your question, uh, to, to this date, um, 4,118 children have been identified as lost. We anticipate this would be much higher. Um, and um, in terms of unmarked grave sites, um, there was 139 schools and it's thought in each, each school has its own unique context and, and narrative, but almost every school is expected to hold um, some form of an informal burial site near the school um, where children will be found. Um, that's, that's, um, that's been the, in discussions of those communities um, since before the TRC was created. It's only, it's only since um, the news has broken that uh, this reality has entered into to the national consciousness in the popular sense. Um, so uh, we will continue to pursue the unmarked grave sites question. Um, originally, we thought uh, the plan was that we would identify as much as we could the loss of children who were lost, and then look into their destiny, that is to try and determine if we could discover where they were um, interred. But then because of these discoveries that happened this year, we find that we're now doing both research projects at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Frognet. Dr. Weiss, please. Um, well, um, as I said before, um, the, um, the justice for these women that were historicized is, is still in process. Um, they, um, the, um, the three ministers that, are, that were involved in the process, in the program and for Himori, they are still being accused by this Crimes. So, but the but the big question is: Can we consider genocides? Can we accuse Alberto Fujimori of genocide? Um, in order to qualify as a crime of genocide, it's necessary to analyze whatever the sterilization were carried out with, uh, and it's um, a specific intention of destroying or annihilation a whole part of the of um, of the determination social group. Okay, um, so um, the state of the question evidence that has been taken into account so far, uh, no evidence has been found that the human acts were accompanied by the necessary and specific intention to annihilate or define a social group of people characterized by carrying on uh, our field work and being Andean or indigenous or, rural, or sorry, sorry, rural, rural areas, as to be able to qualify them as genocides. Thus, it is almost impossible to prove that the sterilizations were directed towards a, a, specific, a, specific, a specific social group, since the Fujimori regime prom, uh, promote these campaigns throughout the Peruvian territory and carry out a uh, delegation of responsibility towards health service workers. So in this point, it's, um, it's very difficult uh, to accuse Fujimori and the three minutes as genocide. But 
they are accused for uh, another crimes for human rights because this program was focused on the indigenous women and the poor population in Peru, which means that uh, these five years that last the, the program, uh, the poorest areas of, of Peru and the women uh, who, uh, who were illiterated or um, just uh, uh, doesn't speak Spanish, this her first language was Quechua, uh, doesn't understand why they are doing this procedure, you know? So um, also when I started the research, I found that uh, in the, um, in the um, uh, health service as, uh, in the community of Huancabamba, um, when the, um, um, uh, the, the woman started complaints in 1996, uh, this health um, center disappeared all the paperwork that proved that this sterilization has been done to this woman. So in other words, it's very difficult to prove uh, with paperwork that uh, this woman has been sterilized by a force, forces. But the proof that we have is the testimony of thousands of women that claim that they were sterilized by coercive uh, methods. Uh, they promise uh, to get, give them um, food if they sterilize her or give them medicine, you know? So um, um, it is it, very difficult, yes, to ask your, your question to, to justify um, or to accusate, sorry, this crime as a genesis, but we have another, another ways you know, to prove it. Thank you very much, Dr. Luis. Our third question today is, is there a way that the government or international law organizations could have prevent these events to happen? Would that be possible? Mr. Frogner, please. Uh, given this was a national program of the, the, the residential schools was a national program that was embodied in what was known as the Indian Act. Um, which was uh, federal legislation that concerns um, pretty much all the life um, events of, of indigenous peoples from birth to death, um, including education, which was uh, the titular um, purpose of the, the residential school system. Um, it's difficult to see how this could have been prevented in law. However, um, having said all that, it should be noted that it was only due to a Supreme Court decision that the Truth and Reconciliation was created to investigate what had happened. So, um, I mean, if the government had been left to their own devices, there would have been no Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This was a decision by the federal government to create a commission to investigate um, this, this history and this loss. So although the law did not prevent the events from occurring, uh, the Supreme Court did create the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, to formally investigate um, the, the history of residential schools. Thank you, Mr. Frogner. Please, Dr. Ruiz. Well, um, the same in Peru. There were not a, a um, group of true reconciliation uh, included the case of this woman. So it was a government um, program. So it's very, very um, uh, difficult that um, international law can uh, work and can um, um, prevent this event. No? Uh, actually, um, the finance of this program was with um, international programs of fertility. So it's, it's, very, it's very tricky because uh, they finance, the Peruvian government financed the program five, during five years with uh, international help, money from another organizations, 
uh, but there is no law, there's no international law that um, can prevent this when the complaints start. No? Thank you very much, Dr. Luis. Now, our, our last question for tonight is you both have mentioned that there are truth and reconciliation efforts that happen in the countries. In one case, started recently in Canada, in the other case, did not include the cases discussed tonight. However, those at that point, at what point and in what way have those reconciliation efforts reached any social reconciliation within each country, despite the, the despite the pitfalls and the bumps in the road, how they have to ascend in terms of the way towards social inclusion, social healing. Please, Mr. Frogner. Well, as I, I, as I mentioned before, um, in its closing reports, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission actually published um, what they called 94 calls to action. Um, and since um, since that time, people have been kind of measuring um, society and measuring the performance of the federal government by those 94 calls to action, um, if, if, if they'd actually accomplished any of them. And the number of, of the calls to action that the federal government have completely addressed <coughs> um, to the point where you could say it has been a success um, is quite low. Um, there's, but um, turning that on its head for a moment, I should point out that um, um, former Senator Murray Sinclair, who was one of the three commissioners for the TRC, um, an indigenous lawyer from, from Manitoba, made the observation during the TRC's um, investigations that um, the residential schools took seven generations to dismantle indigenous communities across the country and it could potentially take another seven generations to revitalize and rebuild those communities. Um, so the reconciliation is an ongoing conversation that's going to last beyond our lifetimes um, and into the future. Um, we can only hope that we can um, establish a strong foundation so that these relationships can continue to grow um, based on what we've learned, acknowledge, and, and maybe heal from and to go forward with. Uh, so. Thank you very much, Mr. Frogner. Dr. Ruiz, please. Yes, um, well, I think we cannot talk about reconciliation at the moment in Peru because um, there are still groups in Lima especially that think that this uh, program was right because this woman, uh, this Andean woman, doesn't um, know about the fertility uh, program and then well it's okay so we need to sterilize them so we don't have we don't need more children uh, in Peru especially poor children so uh, this is that the most of the people the citizens from Lima um, um, they still um, think in that way and the other part is the state the state haven't recognized, um, understand why this woman is still um, um, fighting for justice, justice, no? Um, so uh, since I started the, this investigation in 2012, um, the path of stress women in their search for truth, justice and reparation has been last because many of the women I interview uh, in, in this year and so on has their own idea also that uh, of what has been done to them. Some understood that the sterilization was re reversible. Later I found this it was because the term of ligation, you know, is ligacion in Spanish. And in addition of that, many thought that the campaigns were a government ordered and they had to be followed. Other women felt that it not matter to report these cases acts because the government always um, decide them. Uh, Sometimes understandable if, it, if one takes in account the trauma, we have to take in account, and this is important, the trauma experienced by this woman and men, and men especially in um, poor areas in Peru, in Huancabamba, uh, and they were classified as extremely poverty. Uh, and also um, during the time of great 
violet is perpetrated by the shiny path for Sendero Luminoso. So these people, this person, indigenous woman, uh, has passed the terrible moment of the Sendero Luminoso, the terrorism. Then when this finished, uh, start the um, program sterilizations. Many women were accused from being a terrorism. Um, and then um, the program start, the sterilization start, and they were sterilized. So they don't want it, um, to speak or, the, or denouncing um, this, this, this terrible thing. So I think uh, we put together the history. Uh, it's essential to understand why the silences, the complicity of the state and citizens are due to the case of forest civilization that would carry out during the government of Alberto Fujimori. You know? Are citizens also actors in these campaigns? Is the Peruvian state, state the main po promoter of the great inequalities that exist in a society? And um, Silas uh, is accomplice of the in indifference with uh, which the incomplete has been present in all these years. Um, how far have we, have we advanced in equal rights from citizenship and the state? These questions were a constant. Um, and I think if we can uh, think about reconciliation, first we need to um answer these questions you no know? um first the cities of lima uh why are they indifferent of this uh first secondly the state and then the woman who were the victims but at the moment uh um the case is still open uh thank you to the well thank you to the internet we can now uh, be part of the, um, the process in line, online, so we can um, listen to the testimony of these 2,074 women that are accused uh, to, to the, that are denouncing, denounced Fujimori and the three ministers. Um, but still, the process um, has a lot of political interest. So they have been closed and closed and closed. Um, they are still waiting. Thank you very much, Dr. Luis. And I appreciate uh, all the learning from both Mr. Frockner and Dr. Luis have enlightened us. We would like to invite Dr. Elner if she has comments, remarks after this. Thank you, Andrea. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I found a trailer of Dr. Ruiz's film and saw a snippet with one woman, uh, with an interview with a woman um, from Lima. And I was shocked to hear her say, well, yes, I mean, if it, if it contains, um, you know, uh, further pregnancies and these people are, 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 are or anyway, then yeah, I am for it. And she was a young woman who may be thinking about having children herself at the time. I found that quite shocking, which brings me to more a question. I have I have a few questions because because some of the some of the the accounts that we heard about today are are familiar from other contexts as well, and I wonder whether there's sort of read across or whether there's a possibility of, of maybe working together to try to find ways of breaking through state, um, especially with regard to Peru, um, state reticence and, and the government feeling, well, we don't really have very much to lose because these people are poor, they're rural, we don't really well, care very much about them. They're not our core voters. We don't need to do anything. Of course, what this might do is breed another form of resentment and, and at some point someone might feel moved to protest and protest perhaps with a greater chance of attracting attention i don't know whether that might be violence but then of course you would have to have indigenous communities standing by their women 
and defending them, which might involve men also standing up um, um, and, and trying to move um, things forward. The, the question I had whether there might be a read across or there might be, it's not a direct comparison, but the mothers who protested in Argentina against the disappeared of the 5th of May, I wonder whether it, they had also a very long journey and they also faced partly hostility, I mean, hostility obviously from the regime, but also partly hostility from women who, when the military junta was in power, were on the right side because they complied with an image of womanhood which the, the, the junta promulgated. So they were the co-opted and they did not necessarily see the same. They didn't, they didn't feel solidarity with the women who protested. Um, and I wonder whether there are any links, whether there are, whether Peruvian women, maybe those who, who have had the opportunity to organize a little better um, because they had the funds and, and, and education, whether they might have tried to start connecting with other groups who had a similarly horrific experience? Um, well, it's very interesting that uh, what you're uh, putting on the, on the table. Sorry, my English, I have to practice more. Uh, but I will try to explain. Um, um, first of all, uh, we have to understand but that um, nine years ago, when I started the investigation was eight years ago, I found that they, uh, the one, most of the woman doesn't understand what was happened to her body. So they think that, okay, this is the law. Nobody's gonna hear me, you know. And then um, Ollanta Omala, uh, the last press, two presidents um, promised some justice for this woman. So they start to organize them. So we have women from Cusco, the South, and one woman from the North. And they started to organize on groups, you know. And I was, um, it was very interesting because when I was doing the research, um, I can see how these groups started to work together. They the, was the first time they meet in Lima uh, because they want to uh, take the complaints to the um, Minister of Justice. And in this first uh, meeting that they have, it was very interesting because the, the groups from Anta speak just Quechua. And the groups from uh, the north of Lima, uh, sorry, the north of Peru uh, speak Spanish. But they started to talk, you know, trying to speak together. And they found that this, the same path have they made uh, in this historicization of women. So they left, like, oh, they, they told me that uh, I have too many kids. I have too many children. I have 19 children. So I am like a uh, guinea pig uh, and I need to be historicized. And the woman said, yes, they told me the same thing. And it was very, it was shocking to see how it was a pattern, you see. And I think in that moment, they understand that they have the power. They are not alone. There are groups starting to put them together. And then what the, the justice says, oh, okay, but they are not just two or three or four or five women um, uh, looking for justice. They are a thousand, no? So we can silence this anymore. No, so um, and also we have uh, the um, the media, the networks, uh, Facebook, and these things that uh, another groups of um, citizens Lima um, researchers, feminists, and this uh, organizations group of human rights starting to uh, support this woman. So they started to be activism. Um, I also started to be more active activism with them. Actually, I, I take, um, I travel with uh, Esperanza Guayama, who was one of the victims of this program. She was uh, sterilized when she was pregnant. The, the doctors uh, didn't tell her that she was pregnant. They sterilized her and she lost her baby when she was nine months. 
pregnancy of women. So it was shocking. And her testimony, it was very uh, powerful for this, um, this, um, this program. So um, um, thank you to the University of Kent in, in UK. I have the opportunity and to Natalia Sobrevilla, who, who was um, uh, the person who all was uh, along with us. I, um, we fly to, to UK and we can take this to uh, Amnesty International, to uh, university. We went to BBC London and, and also um, uh, for the, we went to the parliament. And they can hear the testimony of this woman. And she was, I can say she was shocking to see how the people from the other world or the, or the other part of the world, you know, uh, was interested in hear her testimony and how important was that they made this to her and to the, a lot of women. And I think this gave her a lot of power to understand that she has support, no? We went to the BBC radio and everything. And when she came back, she told this to her, the group of women. So I think, I try to be positive in this. And I think that uh, this small, um, how can we say, actions, uh, works that they start to be together uh, more and more and more. Yeah, I'm pretty okay. sure that it, that it will. It may take a while. Um, if the case of Bosnian women who have tried, who had to try for decades to get at least their experiences of rape and, and very serious violations acknowledged as a war wound, that took mm -hmm. a long time. Um, if that's anything to go by, that might, might, might take a while. But what you are already doing and what actually in the end was one of the moments of apparently one of the moments of breakthrough in, in Bosnia was when a young filmmaker made a, a, a film. I think it was a drama. She had had experience of this and had a child and that child's story was was um, was filmed and that started creating much wider awareness, both within Bosnia and in a, well, in, internationally, of course, um, the voices of the women ha had been heard. But the, the other lesson from that is, of course, also that if you haven't got documents, you can use um, witnesses. And that clearly has happened in Peru as well. If thousands of women testify the same thing, then nobody can say, well, they've all made it up, they've, they've aligned their story it's then the volume is really important. If the same story comes up again and again and again, then that, that is another form of credibility. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that, that was terrible and sad, but also extremely interesting. And it's, it's such an indictment of our societies that this is still happening and that women are still being violated in, in, in this particular way. And men were as well, but mm. not in the same numbers partly because the woman is seen as the repository of, of the future of the of the, the tribe or the, the the society. Yes, Andrea, and just one addition about uh, just saying about the audiovisual, powerful the audiovisual, I forgot to tell that um, in, in, uh, along the research, I start filming and the, the um, the product of, I, I made a doc documentary film, which you can find on YouTube, is um, a Futile Voice. And this was a very powerful um, um, tool, not for the citizens, but for the for the women, for the victims. Because when they when I showed them the film, I say that I, I, I won't uh, show the film to the public. As, as um, I want before first to have their permission to show the film to the public. So first I show them the film. And when they see a lot of testimonies, and also there is a very shocking part when uh, I can find some, um, it, when the um, nurser did the surgery and they were laughing and it was it's terrible, they were shocked and they started to talk 
So yes, the, the audiovisual is a powerful tool also to, uh, to take the, the case outside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, am I, I'm, I'm unmuted, yes. Um, that's, that, that's combined. I think that, that but both cases have that in common and, and often um, um, oppressed minorities and, and severely violated minorities or just generally minority or, or, or parts of society that are being um, held at a lower level of the power hierarchy. What helps in finding your power is if you start comparing notes, because one way of marginalizing and one way of oppressing is to separate people from each other. So they, they don't, then they have no chance of identifying that there is a systematic and a systemic issue going on. And I would have thought that that probably happened in Canada as well, because I don't know how, how, much, how much parents actually shared the experience of having their children taken away. Um, in a similar way, this seems to have happened in the US as well, um, that, that children were just taken away and then confined to re-education camps in a, in, a, in, a, in a horrible way. So I don't know, um, Raymond or Raymond. Mr. Frogner, I don't know what you prefer. Um, you know, the you like to comment on this. <laughs> Right. Um, well, first, just addressing what Dr. Ruiz has said, um, Canada did also have a murder of missing women and girls, a murder of missing Indigenous women and girls inquiry um, that just wrapped up with a final report that pointed out that between 1960 and I think it was 2010, uh, there was a 586 unaccounted for um, murder of missing women um, in, in Canada, Indigenous women and girls in Canada um, that required further uh, investigation. Um, and um, so that commission also um, showed that there was a, a, a strong identification of, the, of um, Indigenous women as being kind of um, um, not just marginalized, but um, almost, I wouldn't say, I mean, targeted is maybe too strong a word, but um, that the basic lack of human rights um, fell very he heavily on, those, on, that, on that portion of society. Um, and in addition to that, there was also a program of eugenics in Canada that was particularly pursued by the province of Alberta, actually until the 1960s. Um, and it's been, um, in my own investigations have, and others have um, shown that um, uh, there was a disproportionate amount of indigenous children that were sterilized, boys and girls in that program. Um, so there, there was some similarities there, but speaking more broadly, I think um, on an international level, uh, the, the means of interconnecting these kinds of indigenous um, um, struggles for for human rights is 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 reference to to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, uh, you know, in, in international forums, Indigenous people spent twenty five years arguing for that declaration. Um, to and so uh, and those were those were representatives from Indigenous communities from around the world, Ainu, Maori, um, from South and Central America, um, as well as North America and and even um, the Scandinavian states. So. There is a platform of, of discussion that could be pursued, um, as well as um, you know there are some other um, UN bodies. The, the problem with these bodies is that um, you know they can pass the international law, but the states can choose whether or not they want to implement what's passed. And in fact, in the UNDRIP Article Forty Six, the final article declares that nothing in that article shall impinge on the um, territorial um, definition of the states. That are signing on to that declaration. So um, it, there is kind of a fireproof state guaranteed um, exit strategy for any state that wishes to endorse it. Although Canada has now passed a bill um, just this year um, that states that they will implement the UNDRIP in all future legislation. Um, so it remains to be seen, but it, um, there's been sort of a slow and plodding recognition since 2007 when UNDRIP was passed by governments in Canada to to begin to recognize and implement the UNDRIP's principles in, in legislation. Um, and maybe that's something that could be discussed on an international venue. That brings me to my concluding um, remark before we hand over to the audience for questions. Um, 
it is really quite shocking how long it is taking us to learn from the Nuremberg trials and from the digestion of what happened in a few years in Germany during the Nazi era, because so much of what you have been talking about happened then. And it carried on, or it was instituted as a new policy in different countries in slightly different guises. But it's the, the violation, the crime against humanity is just as terrible. Um, and and it's shocking that the, the path to learning can be so incredibly steep and often going backwards. Now, on that rather depressing note, I will hand over to the audience because I know we already have two questions. And I hand over to Julia to moderate the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Dr. Emma. And I'll hand it out to Michele Groppi, doctor. He is going to moderate. Mila, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, a fascinating discussion. We do have a couple of questions from the audience before we wrap it up and we say uh, bye and we thank uh, um, all, um, all of our splendid panelists uh, properly. So the first one from um, uh, Mr. Eduardo Franco. Uh, so many atrocities then and now. What does reconciliation actually mean? Is it even possible? Mr. Frogner, why don't you start? And then uh, uh, Dr. Ruiz, uh, um, we'd also like to hear from you. And then we, we will uh, um, hop on to the, to the following question. Thank you. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, the Truth Reconciliation Commission in their final reports in 2015, they released a series of final reports and they actually released volume six, an entire study on what does reconciliation mean? Um, where they looked at over a hundred different definitions and examples from around the world, trying to come to terms with it. Um, and essentially they came to the conclusion that reconciliation was basically just to create sustaining respectful relationships across communities over time. Um, and any further elaboration beyond that is, is cultural and regional and um, somehow, you know, it's a subcategory of that kind of meaning. Um, but I mean, even in the discussions in Canada now today, um, reconciliation is thought of as almost um, uh, antique or, or, or antiquated term. Um, more and more people are talking about simply revitalizing Indigenous communities. And revitalization has become a word that's um, almost superseded reconciliation in some circles. Um, but I think they go parallel um, or are or, or, or so interrelated that it's difficult to, to say one is, you know, to choose one over the other. That, um, but uh, self-determination and sovereignty of some form or protected sovereignty is one of the authors of the UNDRIP has, placed, has put it. Um, those kinds of self-determined um, uh, abilities to decide their own destiny for these communities is, is really um, where we're heading towards. Um, and as those communities become more self-possessed and more capable of making decisions that affect their own destinies in life, they can move in parallel with relationships with the state they live in. Um, and I think going forward, that's how reconciliation will evolve. Thank you very much, Mr. Frogner. Dr. Ruiz, um, what does reconciliation mean in, uh, in Peru to you? Uh, floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, it's, it's a very hard question because when I, all the time I think about reconcilia reconciliation, but we have to think about um, which groups include the reconciliation. Are we are going to reconciliation between the um, indigenous groups and the um, city of Lima, the people who live in Lima, reconciliation between the um, indigenous people from Peru and the government. So uh, we need to think that um, in the last years, Peru has um, been um, part of very traumatic events. We have uh, Sendero Luminoso, the terrorism. We have the, the dictador, Alberto Fujimori. The, uh, uh, we have this esterization program that this is still the looking for justice. So I think we are, this generation, my generation, is with the open, um, what do you say, herida? <laughs> I forgot this. Um, it's still hurt. Womb. You know. Womb, thank you. So we are still open. And every time we want to close, there is someone in the history that they are touching it. So 
until we all the government, the citizens understand what this has been made to, to our people. I think it's, it's very difficult to talk about reconciliation, but when I have the opportunity to um, share with the woman who was historicizing this program and I asked them, what do they want? You know, a part of justice, what do they want? And they want uh, public forgiveness. They want that the citizens, especially of Lima, understand that this thing that they, they were made to hurt bodies, affect them um, all her life. No, there is nothing that they can make to repair that because it was already made to, the, the, to their bodies. So I think we are in the way to a reconciliation. We need to work together, uh, but um, it, it, it gonna take you're gonna take years. Maybe the next generation can't find this, and you know, finally uh, we can reconciliation each other. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruiz, uh, especially for the comment. Uh, as for you know, like reconciliation uh, has to like has many layers, uh, and it's not easy. In some cases, it's not even achievable, and therefore it takes time, patience. So it's not just a word that we throw out there. Uh, it actually has serious implication, uh, implications. And so, I mean, I thank you very much for that. Mr. Frogner, we have another one for you, um, given that the question uh, per se is about Canada. Joseph McLean asks, how many of the 94 calls to action has the Canadian government fully addressed? Thank you. Um, it's difficult to say that any have been fully, fully addressed. I mean, some of them, some of them are very simple, like um, providing, um, identification that recognizes the indigenous name of the citizen rather than the, the settler name that was assigned to that person. So, you know, some of those are very easily done. Others um, are, you know, re redesigning the curriculum to incorporate um, residential school histories into provincial and, and, and curriculum for K to 12 students. Um, but really, it's still barely 10. I would say on a, on a, on a there is a, um, the um, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation actually has, as part of their website, uh, a sort of a barometer measuring the 94 calls to action and which ones are actually being met and how close they are being met by. It's a moving target. Um, and as I said, in terms of, of reconciliation, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of ongoing respectful relationships that will last for generations. So I don't know if they will all ever be completely successfully done, but um, it's a slow, um, it's very slow, very plotting. And so far um, more care needs to be given to them. That's for sure. Mina, thank you very much for this. Uh, um, actually, um, Mr. Frogner, we, we have another follow-up question uh, um, always by Eduardo Franco, going back to the concept of, uh, of the sovereignty or the power to choose their own destiny that you were mentioning uh, uh, in a very interesting way. Um, Eduardo asks, well, actually, wouldn't that cause the exact opposite? There is separation. It, uh, it, uh, it almost sounds as, uh, um, as if it would create two separate uh, peoples. Uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm reading from the chat. Uh, right. Would you like to expand on that point? Um, well, I think that this goes back to the very first comment I made at the start of the talk, which was how do we reimagine belonging in a society of diversity? Um, that in these colonial societies, we're comprised of a, a very large number of, of um, groups that you know claim some sort of quasi-independence in some level or another. I mean, Quebec is another example. Um, but I mean, even the Prime, um, Prime Minister Gretchen made the observation that, you know, if Canada is divisible, um, so is Quebec, because there's many Indigenous communities within Quebec as well. So I think the question is not whether or not um, sovereignty means independence. Um, I think the question is more um, in, in choosing your own life paths and having the ability to have uh, control over your destiny, um, what does that mean in terms of the relationships with other communities that you exist beside? Because nobody exists in a vacuum. You know, thank you very much for that, Mr. Progner. Um, anybody else? Uh, um, any, any question for our panelists? Uh, uh, any, any questions for um, Dr. Ines Ruiz? Julia, do you, do you have any questions? I mean, please go, go ahead. Yes, this question is for Dr. Ruiz. Dr. Ruiz, 
it is true that there is no enough documentation to, let's say, uh, put together a complaint for genocide. However, do you, given the size of uh, the, the number, well, the large number of women, all, almost 300,000, we're talking a lot, considering that there is underreporting, that many of them die, and they, this was portrayed or, excuse me, perpetrated without their willing, without they even being able to understand what was done to them. Isn't it possible to, let's say, argue, to elaborate the push, the envelope, to include this as a genocide or a holocaust or some sort of claims? Because the fact of um, esterilizing people is a, a definitely call to not have them and to do it a specific group to me, it looks evidently as a clean. So can we just maybe push the envelope in that regard? Do you think it's possible, doctor? How could we do it? Well, um, yes, this is a question that a lot of uh, lawyers have made. I'm not a lawyer, so it's difficult for me to um, uh, explain. But uh, I know that, um, yes, it's, it's um, it's a, it's a evidence that it with this was this problem was made for a specific group, you know, indigenous women poverty. The problem is uh, not only that we don't have enough documentation. The problem is that still the person that are accusate Fujimori and their ministers, they reject the accusations and say that they actually claim that this one is an isolated claims that there was this two or three women that have this uh, and this was a part of the program and they are not responsible for these events just the medicals or the um, practitioners practitioners um so they they are continued denying the, the events so it's very difficult, um, um, but I know that there is a group of law feminist lawyers that um, lawyers that they are looking for this. So we will see the, the process is still open. Uh, we will see what happens. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well. I mean, on that note, then at this point, uh, let me reiterate uh, this huge thanks to to our splendid guests so in order uh, mrs raymond frogner from canada dr ines ruiz from peru and uh, uh, our our colleague dr andre elner from dsd king's college london and to our moderator uh, julia hodgins thank you thank you very much uh, everyone for uh, uh, an enlightening discussion uh, on uh, i must say like pretty um disturbing uh, but at the same time, uh, like much needed topic. So huge, huge thanks. We need more, uh, more of these discussions within the realm of international security, emotions, people, collective memories, and looking forward, the reconciliation, uh, so uh, societal restructuring. These are all important elements of international security, international relations, uh, and hopefully thanks to your hard and dedicated work, uh, one day our societies will grow stronger and more cohesive. Uh, so from the bottom of my heart um, uh, huge appreciations to to all of you and to our, our guests uh, and last but not least uh, to our school security study lizzie danny also for making this happen uh, thank you very much uh, and have a good uh, night or rest of the day in uh, in the western hemisphere uh, hemisphere take care Bye. thank you very thank much you very that much. was very 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 interesting take, take care, care thank you take care, everyone Bye. Thank you.